the words, you know, supply and demand also reflects supply and demand of capital. This all occurred not in a period of a shortage of capital, not in a period of difficulty in getting a bank loan, not in a period of difficulty in getting a mortgage, just the opposite. It was as easy as possible. And the result was that we flooded the market with money. We kept lowering the cost of the money. You know, so completely in the United States, almost got to negative interest rates. In a lot of parts of the world, we got to literally negative interest rates. You know, and, and all of a sudden, everybody says, well, what do I do? You know, what do I do with the money? All of a sudden, I've got more money than, you know, than I ever thought possible. I've got access to all kinds of capital, and I've got to find ways to use it. We had institutions that were piling up money, looking for places to invest. And, you know, we're all subject to, you know, changing flows. I mean, when I first, in 1989, was the first time that I, quote unquote, tapped into the institutional market to raise money for real estate. Imagine how shocked I was to find out that 80% of the institutions that I called upon did not have an allocation for real estate. They didn't have an allocation for stocks, bonds, municipal bonds. Didn't that real estate wasn't a quote unquote investable class. Fast forward 20 years, you couldn't find anybody who didn't have a real estate allocation. So they then had a real estate allocation. And the question is, how do they fulfill that allocation? Buy more real estate. And they did. And I'm afraid they're going to be sorry. Well, I think that I'm 81 years old. So that means that I was around in the 70s. I remember in 1978, you know, we closed the loan on an apartment project we had just bought, and the inflation rate that day was 13 and three quarters. 13 and three quarters was the inflation rate. So I was forced to learn how to navigate a very, very difficult and treacherous environment, even though it also was an environment that created opportunity to do really, really well. I haven't forgotten that experience. And so despite all of the excitement and stuff that has occurred over the last 30 years, I haven't forgotten what it meant. I haven't forgotten what it took to generate that kind of inflation. I looked at what the Fed was doing and I looked at what they were, you know, what, they, what I saw in the, in the fact that the interest rates were going significantly below the inflation rate. You don't need to see. All you need to know is that if the cost of money is four or five hundred basis points less than the inflation rate, you, you know, things are going to get turned upside down. I don't think you need a PhD to figure that out. It's just another example of supply and demand. And where all of a sudden the supply became excessive. The result is that, you know, over the last 10 years, we sold a lot of real estate. We bought very little. And I'm, I'm waiting and hoping that there'll be an opportunity to reload and buy, you know, a bunch of more stuff. But, you know, I, I made a fortune buying real estate at below its replacement cost, which therefore guaranteed me that the guy couldn't build something across the street at less than my basis. Everything today is still being priced and dealt with at numbers that are above, in effect, that would, would allow somebody to build and compete with me at a lower cost. That doesn't make sense.
raise interest rates. We got to raise interest rates three or four or five percent. I mean, we have to, we have to make it painful. Everybody's so worried about whether we're going to have a soft landing. I'm worried about what kind of landing we're going to have. Because if we don't stop the inflation, it's a very, very deleterious thing. I mean, it robs purchasing power of everybody. And, you know, you, for until 1971, the world was protected from inflation by the fact that we didn't have fiat currencies. We had currencies that were pegged to the price of gold. And then in 1971, we, in effect, converted from pegged currencies to fiat currencies. And today, you know, there's nothing backing the U.S. dollar. We've increased, we've increased our debt seven, eight trillion dollars in three or four years. How does that work? I don't know how that works. I don't know how, what, what's going to happen. Because I think that we just can't, just can't, you know, again, supply and demand. You just can't create that much new supply and have it work. I'm, you know, my big concern for the last five years has been loss of the U.S. as the reserve currency of the world. I think that that probably would result in a, 20 or 25 percent reduction in the standard of living in the United States. We have this extraordinary benefit of being able to issue paper. If we couldn't issue that paper or we had to pay the real price of issuing that paper, our life would be different. All you have to do is look at what happened to you know, England after World War II. Up until that time, sterling was the reserve currency of the world. And then it wasn't. And then all of a sudden, England became, you know, part of the sick man of Europe, as opposed to the leading economic player in, in the world that set the standard, as opposed to had to come up with it to meet the standard. I just wanted to jump in here and tell you about this new valuable resource that we created for you. The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. If you're not satisfied with where you're at financially, whether that be not having enough savings at the end of each month, watching your cash being eroded away by inflation, or maybe you're not sure where to get started with investing. Down in the description below, we put together a free guide for you called the four simple steps to take control of your personal finances and life. You can get this free guide by clicking the link in the description below. You know, you always ask yourself the question, you know, would I buy it at this price? Would I sell it at this price? You have to consider the tax implications. Uncle Sam takes a big bite of everything you sell. So you need to be keenly aware of what your after-tax yield is, not your pre-tax yield. And what you paid for is much less important than how much you get left with after you satisfy Uncle Sam. Sam, you sold the equity office rate to Blackstone for $39 billion in 2007, speaking of selling. And that was yes. one of the most insane bidding wars in history. Looking back on that transaction and your decision to sell, what memories or lessons have stayed with you? Well, you're right. It was quite an experience. And, and what was interesting was that uh, you know, I had a bunch of really, really smart guys on the other side. And... In the beginning, maybe six months before the transaction, someone approached me and wanted to buy an equity office. And I was really surprised because I thought that equity office was just too big for anybody to buy. And then I really, at that time, thought that we'd probably own this company forever. And we be passed on to other generations of investors because it's just the scale 
was so large that it just didn't fit you know, anybody doing a buyout of it. And that particular offer or inquiry was at a price that, frankly, I, I didn't think was attractive even if I wanted to sell or could sell. And so I didn't do anything about it. I said no, and that was the end of it. Give or take. And, and by the way, as with all of our companies, we continually have looked at our companies and done an analysis of what they thought they were worth so that we never were in a position where we weren't prepared to understand what we owned and what we thought what we owned was worth. About six months later, Blackstone approached us and as opposed to giving us an offer, they said, what would it take for Sam to sell equity office? And I remember my response being, yes, it would take a godfather offer, which is, you know, from the Mario Puzio story of the godfather. And I said, it would take a godfather offer for, for me to consider selling equity office. And I remember responding to the broker and saying, that's what it would take. And much to my surprise, they came up with one. And I was extraordinarily flattered by what they thought the company was worth. And I, and I said, well, I said, I was willing to consider it, but I would only consider it if the breakup fee which is the fee that was paid to a loser if there was a competitive bid, was small enough that it would not discourage anyone from competing. Because obviously, anytime there is a sale, it's nothing more than price discovery. And I wanted to make sure to protect my investors, to protect myself, that I could say that I had this, you know, gone through and, and identified what I thought the real value was. And so we ended up concluding a deal with his then $36 billion with a $200 million break of fee. And normally, a break of fee in a deal like that would be give or take 3%. So normally, that break of fee should have been a billion two or something like that. Instead, the break of pay was 200 million, which gave me comfort in that no one would be discouraged from bidding based on the fact that there was a humongous break of fee and that the price of playing, that's just playing, was so high. So that was, that was one of the first and part of the strategy involved in the sales. And by the way, you know, I'm a great believer that there's always significant strategy in everything you do. Whether you're selling or you're buying, there's a strategy involved and a thought process that's involved. And so we concluded a deal. I think it was, I think the first price was $48 a share, a $200 million breakup fee. And then there were various people who you know, expressed an interest or theoretically expressed an interest. One never knew, you know, until you see the color of their money. So the Blackstone people, John Gray in particular, you know, looked at the situation and said, you know, we're vulnerable. Somebody could easily, you know, outbid us. And we didn't want to be outbid. And so he came back to us even before we had a second bid and said, you know, we'll raise the price if you raise the breakup fee. I, you know, we'll, we'll pay a little more if you'll make it a little more expensive for anybody to compete with us. We agreed. And so then the price went from, I can't remember exactly, but I think it went from 48 to 51. And then there was some discussion and in speculation that there was another group that was, I was about to get involved in, 
But that other group had a problem. And the problem was that the banking system had been tied up by Blackstone. Blackstone had, in one unsubtle fashion or another, suggested that almost everybody could play. Nobody wanted to, quote, be on the wrong side of the deal. So literally, a potential competitor couldn't finance competing bid. So then it became my responsibility to sit down with Blackstone, which I did, and in a nice, you know, comfortable fashion, explain to them that how we did have antitrust laws and that, you know, tying up all of the sources of capital for a potential competing bid didn't really fit the definition of what was, quote, acceptable behavior. And they ultimately agreed in that uh, let go a whole bunch of financing sources that ultimately became the financing sources for a competing bid. Whereupon the Blackstone people then looked at their situation and said, gee, maybe we ought to raise the bid a little more. We could get a higher breakup fee. And more important than a breakup fee was that the original provision did not allow Blackstone to have any contact with any potential buyer of the assets of the OP that Blackstone didn't want. And so they came back to us with still a higher bid with a higher breakup fee, but most important allow with us agreeing that they could engage in conversations with potential buyers who wanted to buy pieces of EOP that they didn't want to own. That's how we ultimately made the deal, where they were given the right to negotiate with potential buyers for parts of the portfolio. We increased the breakup fee to $700 million, and then we closed the deal February 7th. It was a great day. I'm still smiling. Interestingly enough, Blackstone, to their credit, was able to liquidate almost two-thirds of the portfolio at prices above what they were paying us for the whole. So the net result was that from our perspective, the deal was an enormous economic success. From Blackstone's perspective, because they had stole two-thirds of the portfolio at a premium, well, their measurement of how they did, they did extraordinarily well. The unfortunate part of the story was that almost every single buyer who bought anything, like any poor part of the portfolio from Blackstone, ended up losing because they had basically crossed the line and paid too much. So that was my experience with that particular transaction. I learned a lot of lessons from it. Most significant lesson is, you know, if you're a seller, create competition. Sellers who don't create competition don't get the highest price. And at the same time, being the last guy on the totem pole to buy something also doesn't likely produce a positive result. You know, I, as a sport or as a hobby, I ride motorcycles. And uh, when you ride a motorcycle, then you feel the wind come through your helmet. He realized that you're in total control of what you're doing. There's a sense of freedom that's irreplaceable. In the same manner, having the resources to not start every conversation with, can I afford it, whether I want to do it, are two very different things. There's nothing more important to me than freedom. I'm a great student of, you know, I read enormous amounts 
I'm very understanding and knowledgeable about loss of freedom to all kinds of people, you know, from all kinds of different situations, many of them, frankly, you know, very negative. So I guess what I would say to you is that I view money as a way of eliminating a step to achieve my objectives, but not be constrained by limitations. In the same manner, when it comes to liquidity equals value, you know, that's something that I coined for my own benefit to remind me of the fact that I'm constrained only by the exterior events that occur around me to the extent that I have a liquidity, I can make choices. And if I can make those choices, I can do so without the constraints of liquidity. You know, it's, I don't have to start by saying, well, where am I going to get the money? But I'm going to start by saying, how do I want to spend the money? What do I think is important? I think those are, those are criteria that define what I call freedom. And it's certainly been a big part of my life. When you're in a bubble, where the market top is, whether we're heading into a crisis, I mean, we really don't know. Um, maybe Netflix and Tesla will be up 40% and we'll be laughing at the people that thought it might be a crisis. When the market starts to go down, um, it sometimes continues to go down a lot more.